Hi teammates, this is Sean J. McCall and this is the Eurostep where we try to get a look at the background information of different athletes or general managers or people associated with basketball, especially in Europe, but also worldwide and that's why I'm really glad for my guest tonight. Um, before we begin, make sure if you would like to s ask a question to my guest um, at the bottom of the screen, there should be a there should be a comment box. You can write it directly there or the question mark with the speech bubble. And I'll try to infuse those questions in as we go along. So let's give that a try. My guest for tonight's episode is retired from the game as an active professional. Uh, but saying that he has a lot going on would be an understatement. Um, Tremaine Dalton is a busy, busy man. He's a product of going both to an NAI school, St. Mary's, and at the time, a D2 school, uh, West, Virginia Universe, West Virginia University Tech. Sorry. Um, he then played professionally in Israel and Australia um, for many years, and he also won the Red Bull King of the Rock one-on-one um, -on -one tournament back in 2011. Even while playing, he was also busy working um, with governments of the places where he played. And we'll get back to that in a minute. In 2017, he, he founded the Process Basketball, which is doing fantastic things all around the world, uh, developing youth programs, um, and different initiatives. And his latest project, the Global in Initiative, which he partners with my, one of my former guests, uh, Khalees Lloyd, is helping to build infrastructure to help girls and women succeed in all levels of basketball and I'm really excited to have him on here and let me grab him now let's go live hello to all of you that just joined appreciate you coming around so let's see if we get a move oh, there we go what's good hello. man what's up what's up how you doing good man glad to have you on I'm glad I'm here man thank you for inviting me I see, I see the background out there. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm yeah, loving I'm that here, background. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of hard work, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're going to get into that right now. Yeah, yeah, let's get it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so thanks for coming on. And um, right now I'd like to tell how, how we met. And it's crazy because I did the interview with Khalees, and, um, and then I got an a, 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 a email or a, a DM from someone that you know, Stephanie, Hi, yep. Stephanie. Shout out to Steph Stephanie. I see you. I see yep. you on here as well. Yep. Um, and she said, "Hey, why don't you check this guy out? Let's 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 get him on the show. Let's. Right. He's got some good things going on." And I was like, "Bet. Right. Let me check him out." That's what I did. And then I saw all the. I mean, you are just mad busy. Man, thank mad you, man. Busy. Thanks for checking me out. And, and so I, I was like, "Hey, I, that's a, a a guy I gotta have on the show." And that's how right. it, that's how it came came about. You know. Right. And and that's that's the the power of the internet when right. when it's used for good, you know. You, right, you get right, somebody. Right. I would have probably never been able to contact you or, you know, get to know you um, like these last weeks, months, um, if it hadn't been for Stephanie reaching out and also right. just the power of the internet. And that's right. that's also a good thing, you know. Right. So yeah, so, it's a beautiful thing, man. Uh, I, I feel like network is the most important thing when it comes to basketball or business. Right. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Stephanie, she's my media director. So, and you know, Khalees, we've been working together for a long time. So just yeah. a lot of different people who I know throughout this basketball and the growth of what I've been doing around the world. It's just been a blessing, really. And you know, you know, just like I do, the basketball world is hella small. Right. right. There's seven degrees of separation between I know you, you know this guy, we right, play right, together right, on right. an AAU team. It's like, right. it's crazy. Right, 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 right. So, All right, yeah, so man, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, man. Let's get started. Um, here's how the interview will go. Um, we'll talk about the athletic career um, and then go a little bit on the personal side of what, what you do outside of basketball um, of for being more than just an athlete. Yeah. And just feel comfortable with, with what you want to share, you know. Um, you know consider it more of a, a just a chill talk than right. an actual interview. Okay. And, um, yeah, let's get to it. Let's get it. So yeah. we're going to start out um, at the end of your college career, Okay. Okay. Um, so you started out at an NAI school, NAIA school, and ended at right. a D2 school. Right. It was actually the opposite. I started oh, it's the opposite. Yes, yeah, the opposite, yeah. And, I mean, we both know that this, the, the size of a school doesn't mean 
how good a, a hooper a guy right. is or a girl right, right. is, you know? Right. Um, did you find it hard to get your name out there to find an agent maybe to take that next step to, to go over to Europe or go to play somewhere else after coming from a small school? Right. Well, my situation was very unconventional. Uh, it wasn't like the, you know, I was killing and I ended up getting an agent and I ended up going overseas. Uh, with college, uh, I was playing at the University of St. Mary's. It was an NIA school. And uh, lo and be me and the coach didn't get along. You know, you know how it is sometimes. One of those situations, yeah. Yeah, it's one of those situations. But I was killing you know, uh, me, him, and the AD, we came to an agreement where I would either play the first half or the second half. And I was averaging 20 a game. So, and then, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, at the end of my, I got records at that school for only playing half the game. So, I would go in the game, play in the first half. Second half, I wouldn't play at all. You know Did what I'm saying? Did the coach have, have bets on the game or what? <laughs> Man, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. But my efficiency was so high. Field goal percentages in the 70s, three-point percentages in the upper 40s, you know what I'm saying, free throw percentages in the 90% and stuff like that. And I ended up getting my pre-draft workouts and stuff when I came out of college, you know what I'm saying? And that's when I realized it's not necessarily about what school you go to. It's not even necessarily about your specific numbers. It's really about your rate of efficiency, you know what I'm saying? And my efficiency was killer. I mean, 15, 20 minutes a game, and I'm averaging a dub, you know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it's bananas, yeah. So... How did you find, how did you come overseas? Like, how did you, did you find an agent or did you have to look for an agent or how was that process for you? So the next step was I played semi-professional basketball. I played in the ABA and I played in the IBL. Uh, both leagues, my first game in the ABA, I dropped 50. So, you know, that woke people up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was playing for the Detroit Hoops. After that, I played in the IBL for the Grand Rapids Flight. I was averaging like 28 a game. Then I went to Arizona. I played for the Arizona Rhinos or something like that. And I was averaging 30 a game there. You know what I'm saying? But it still didn't come that way. Like, I still didn't get an agent. I still didn't get an opportunity. And that was before the era of social media, too. Right. Uh, what got me overseas was playing in that King of the Rock tournament. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because one of the people I beat, for example, is Dusan Balut. And, you know, he is uh, the number one 303 player in the world currently. Right. And, you know, I, I waxed him a little bit. <laughs> you know, people <laughs> saw that. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it was a couple other players there, but it was a guy specifically from Israel. He was like, man, you, you a bucket. Like, come out to Israel. Like, see how I went. And I went out there and I tried out for teams and I ended up getting on the second league team. So that's crazy, man, because, I mean, that's anyway unconventional. And it right. doesn't matter Super how you get there. The only thing that matters is, is that you get there. And so you were at the right, right. place at the right time and, right. and got over. So what do you think you could have known better before you came overseas? Like, how do you think you could have, you could have informed yourself or was there a way for you to, to look for an agent or something like that? How, how do you think you would have been better informed? Uh, for me, when I first came out of college, I got an offer to go to South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was for 25 grand a month. But I was so NBA, right. NBA workout, or stuff bus. like that. Yeah, I was on that. So I didn't take that opportunity. And then once I tried to jump back in, it was already too late. Yeah. Uh, me personally, away from those dynamics, I would say I just didn't work hard enough. Mm. Like, uh, I would, so I didn't even, on or off the court, I just didn't work hard enough. Uh, and I'm, I'm okay with admitting that to myself. That's what mm. led me to where I am now. So I was so much of, yeah, yeah. I was so much of a bucket that I was like, okay, what I need to work hard for. And it came easy to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any isolation situation, it was a bucket. Pick and roll, whatever, whatever the situation may be. So mm -hmm. I just felt like I reached, I was a bit arrogant, you know what I'm saying? So I didn't take the time to do the research. I didn't take the time in that, in my peak, to connect with the people I needed to connect with because I mm -hmm. felt like it would just automatically happen. And it was a realization. Um, what's something that you wish you would have known back then? To listen to people. Mm -hmm. uh, to, I wish I had the networking abilities that I have now back then. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because at the time, I was somewhat of an introvert, and I was just committed to this basketball, and that's all I was doing. Mm -hmm. And again, like, I can admit, at that, in a particular time, I was just in my own, I'm a bucket, you know what I'm saying? Plus, you, you got to take a step back. This basketball is what got me out the hood. This, got, this basketball is what created these type of opportunities. Uh, when I was in high school and stuff like that, my goal wasn't even to go to the NBA from the get-go. Uh, when I used to go to different neighborhoods and parks, I tell the story in every interview I go to or any interview I have. I used to go to different parks to go against the rival 
you know, cruise and this and the other because my stepfather, he was in that, you know, drug game and stuff like that. So it wasn't nothing happened to my family and my brothers. You know, so I would go all the way across town, play whoever, and then when I see him, wherever, people wouldn't bother me, my brothers, my I, family, and nobody. I, I know exactly that feeling, yeah. Right, right, right. So once I got that validation, the rest was cake. You know what I'm saying? So I, was, I didn't really realize the business side of it. I didn't really realize that once I got to college, I just went to college. I didn't care where I was at because it got me out the hood. It got me out that situation. Uh, and, you know, I wish that I would have took, but sometimes, you know, it takes us as a people to be in platforms such as mine and yours to reach back, to teach people these type of platforms, to give people exactly. these opportunities that me and you couldn't create. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because back then, you know, we just had to fend for ourselves pretty much. You know, it's crazy because basketball. it's crazy because like you just brought back a, a crazy memory for me that I that I haven't thought about in years. Like I wasn't a hood dude, right? Right. I was I was noted for for basketball, but I had right. friends that were hood dudes, right? Right, right, right. So I, I mean, back in Vegas back then, the Bloods and the Crips was getting really big, and and right. so you kind of had to choose a side. But I had right. been playing playing basketball with these guys or playing football with these guys since we were real little you know so right. i grew up with guys that were bloods i grew up with guys that were crips but right. at some point you kind of like had to had to choose you know right right and, I understand. and the crazy thing is because i was good at basketball everybody they kind of protected me they kind of shielded me especially right. when i was in high school because right. because it was like okay he's gonna make something of himself so right. if i was at a party and something was about to pop off i would be warned and they would say sean right. you got to get out of here Right, 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 and, right, right, right. You know, that's that's the part of the reason also why I want to give back. I want right. to help people because, I mean, I got helped a lot coming right. up. And, right, right, and right. So without that, and that's why I really appreciate what you, what you're doing and, and and your story about about that from from back home is is it really hits home to to me and I hadn't I hadn't thought about that in a long time, man. That's man, crazy. it's good. We, that's what I'm saying. It's good we can connect on that level. Because, like, people don't understand that. People see when we go overseas and go to the NBA, that's all they see is ass. Yeah. They don't understand that a lot of this basketball is how we survive. And then when a lot of people ask me, right, how I even got into the process of basketball was I filled in, I filled in the niche. You know, uh, in my time, when I first started it, you know, at the end of the day, Europe, European basketball, they, needed, they wanted to learn that one-on-one -on -one skill set. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the few coaches in the world who know how to translate that into the European game. And that's why I took off so fast. But they don't understand why the biggest separation between European basketball and American basketball, because talent-wise, it's starting to catch up, especially with yeah. these different African communities. Yeah. And then, you know, our generation having kids, you know, overseas yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. But that biggest difference, it, the difference is those stories that me and you have. It's that killer instinct. It's that survival point. It's those experiences that we guarantee buckets. It's not like soccer, where you can turn it over and then it's okay. Like, nah, we get the ball, it's a bucket. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Not, the percentages is higher because of the K, with the KDs, with the LeBrons, with the you know Westbrook tripping a little bit, but with people <laughs> like that, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Kyrie's and people because the survival point is different, the threshold is different, and that's right. for me when I see European basketball and when I see American basketball, that that's the clear separation right there. Yeah. Like, what can yeah. you do against a guy who you don't know where you're gonna eat? You know, he had to go through that mentally for like 20, exactly. 15, 20 exactly. years. Exactly. You, you know got what I'm different saying? worries. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and not to say that in Europe and different places that they don't have their own struggles. But from my understanding, from my view, it's different. That, yeah, that specific struggle is different. You know what I'm saying? So when you come across a lot of American players, when they come across European players, Australian players, whatever, there's no bias. You know what I'm saying? Ameri yeah. uh, the American player is going to go out. And, and it's starting to change. Yeah. Uh, a lot of European players are starting to come to the States. And they starting to understand this dynamic. They starting to connect into it in their own way. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And that's why basketball as a whole is starting to improve. Uh, let's take it back to the the king of the court. Right. Not many people have have that on their resume that they are the number one or the the top one on one player in the world. Right. What was that experience like? Walk us through that. Man, uh, my, again, my motivation was different. <laughs> you know, every uh, when I first won the one in Arizona. You know, everybody was in there for some status stuff. They wanted to be the best in Arizona. They wanted to be, ah, shit, I was down on my last $10. You know what I'm saying? And then when you won it, you got $1,000. So it was easy for me. Everybody, every, everybody was fooled. It wasn't even about the tournament, the status. 
That's why you rarely see any footage of me in front of the trophy talking and showing off because they didn't even give me my money at the end of it. But once I won, and I was like, let me get my money and get up out of here. You know what I'm saying? And that translates to back when I was a kid. When I was a kid, I used to play people one-on-one, -on -one, and I used to say, look, you got nine points, and I got zero, and if you score, you get 100 bucks. You know what I'm saying? And with me not even having 100 sometimes, and I got to score all 10 to get that 100, and, I, and I'm undefeated with that. You know what I'm saying? So when it was time for me to play in the King of the Rock, it's a different mindset. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was cake. I was like, these. I came in, I did did what I needed to do, and I got up out of there. You know, <laughs> yeah. What What was that? What was that like? I mean, I've never I've never been to one of those tournaments or, or, right. or competed in one of those tournaments. But what is that like to 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 face these guys and and really put your stamp on an event and win it? Right. Well, I mean, you're seeing different people from around. Well, first of all, Arizona, and then we go to the international tournament. I was, I made it to the Elite Eight, and you're seeing people from all over the world. And that right. specific tournament, it was even NBA players in it. You know what I'm saying? I think the yeah. prize was like 50 grand or something like that in the 64 games. At the most, you're playing eight games, eight one on ones for 50 grand. That's cake. So you're seeing different people from all over the world. You're seeing because it was fresh. You're seeing different people on playing in Europe, like Dusan, for example. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity. We played in a, a Alcatraz, everybody on the boats. It was like Mortal Kombat, if you want to call it that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So for me, but me, my, my, my mind was different. Like, I, wasn't, I was cooling, I was networking, I was chopping it up with people. And then when it was time to play, like, I did what I needed to do. Uh, I never was that guy to, you know, I take the Floyd Mayweather route. Like, Floyd, Mer Floyd he says he doesn't watch film when he has to fight somebody, right? And uh, I understood that because he knows who he is. And not to say... Right. Concentrate on film. yourself. Yeah, yeah. Not to say don't watch film. All that stuff is important. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of things is about why. What's the reason? Uh, not, and when people watch film, sometimes they try to compare themselves to other players or whatever the situation would be. But if you know who you are and you're just doing it for analytics, then that changes the dynamics of why you're watching film. Mm -hmm. I never watched film on nobody, so I didn't care who was out there. You know what I'm saying? And hey, I, I just went at people. <laughs> like That person is a person just like me, so... You know, and, and we all and we have moments that we need to capitalize on while we're on the floor. Right. I'm just gonna take advantage of those moments. That's what it was for me. So after you won won that, then you go over to Israel. You're playing in the second right. league in Israel, but right. practicing with the first league team there. Which right. team was it? Uh, Maccabi Haifa. Yeah, Maccabi Haifa. And yep. so, what was that experience like for you? Now you had been a couple years a couple years out of school, right? Yeah, I was out of school, yeah. so you're a couple yeah. years out of school. You're a little bit older, a little bit more mature, right. body wise, right. um, right. mental wise. First right. time away from home. What was it like playing in Israel, playing with the second league team, but practicing with the first right. league team? Man, it was tough. Uh, playing wise, it was just a different game. It was faster than a semi pro. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A semi pro game, you, and even a one on one, you slowing it down. You can you know, right. isolate some situations. You know, in Europe, they just run it. You know, so it took me a little while to adapt. But people saw. I guess how much I was a bucket, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So th it was worth investing in that type of potential. Uh, I came close to playing Kobe Bryant, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that specific team, they was doing uh, the whole uh, American tours when they was playing NBA teams and stuff like that. And when Kobe tore his Achilles, I was on a, pra I was the, on a practice squad for that team. Uh, and the next year I was supposed to get a contract, but it just didn't fall through the way it was supposed to be. But it was still a blessing on my side because mm -hmm. uh, I'm the type of guy, wherever I'm at, I'm a connect. And uh, when I was there, I was working with the Israeli government too. That's you right. That's saying? what I want yeah, to talk yeah. about next. So, yeah. so not only were you doing your, your professional thing, but you, right. you then reached out to the Israeli government to see what you right. could do uh, there. How did, how, how did that come about and what were you right. able to, to accomplish while you were there? Right. Well, uh, I was close to some people out there and I was always in the community initiative when I was there. And, uh, one of my, it, I just got hooked up. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go into the deep, deep, dark details, but I just got hooked up. Yeah. And uh, long story short, I was the director of sports and education when I was out there in, in a city called Jesse Cohen. It's in Holon. Oh, in an area called Jesse Cohen. It's in Holon. And uh, that was where a lot of Russian and, uh, what is uh, Eritrean people were. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what, and, and I was helping those African communities with different programs and stuff like that. And I didn't know Hebrew. So it was, it was uh, new to them. They was like, wow, this American is here. And we see him every now and again in the street ball parks. We see him every now and again on the pro circuit and this, that, and the other. And uh, people just really, they was, I was really receptive to people. And people was, you know, coming back to me to be a part of these programs. 
And uh, even the people who worked there, they just was like, it was different, you know, and they were just shocked, me being American and me doing this whole professional basketball, really engaged with these communities. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? It, it, was just, it was just different for them. I mean, I, I put together a program out there for, the, uh, for it was like a, a basketball tournament for people who are deaf. And then I was able to partner with Nike out there, you know what I'm saying? And it was just, I was just creating a lot of different things with philanthropy and stuff because I always go back to my roots. Right. of where I came from. And it don't matter where I'm in the world, I try my best to put those programs together. I think that's so dope because, of course, um, when when you play overseas, you want to focus on your job. Your job right. is playing basketball. But I think it's so dope that you were able to uh, look outside the box. And like you said, like people were like, wow, this American guy is doing something for us. When normally right. Americans go to, to, and I was guilty of it too, you go, you play, you leave. You know, you're right, not leaving right, any right. footprints. Right. You're not leaving your stamp on anything. You're going, doing your job, and then leaving, of right. course. So, right, right. so I really, I really commend that. And I guess that's, that was probably what led the groundwork for what you do now. What kind of maybe that was like the first step to take you to what you're doing now, right? One hundred percent. Once I, I was already doing a little bit of community initiative before, but once I got going, when I, once I, that was my first time ever doing it in Europe. And once I tapped in like that, it just branched out to so many different areas because at the end of the day, it's Israel. Israel is a hot spot in the world. I mean, how many Americans is going over there and doing stuff like that? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially, yeah, you know, missiles flying in the air. I'm looking up. I'm <laughs> like, you know, uh, how many Americans is really connecting with different communities and stuff like that? Really, especially in a place like Israel, really engaged like that. Right. A lot of basketball players, they just go to their room and they just play video games. Right. I was never that. I'm in the city. I'm playing at the park with the local. I'm doing the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Because I, w I just wanted to be a part of that. I wanted that to be uh, one of my stamps for people to know me, you know, for the rest of my life. When did you first start thinking that this might be something that you can build on and, and, and really outside of basketball, or, uh, not outside of basketball, but um, when you're finished playing? Because, of course, at that time, you didn't right. know how long you were going to play. So when was right. it that you kind of thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do when I'm done playing? Right. Uh, I was in Australia, and that's when I was playing out there. And the season really wasn't going so well. And uh, I, the coaching staff really wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, not just for me, but for even the younger players. So when I was seeing what was going on, I'm like, we was practicing two days a week, this, that, and the other. But a lot of the players was, yeah, you know, so a lot of the players, they was asking me, uh, could I train them? Everybody want to be a bucket. Everybody was asking me, can I teach them? Can, I, can they learn that skill set that I got? Because, you know, I really believe in that. You know, three dribble max, two dribble max. And right. everybody wanted to learn. Love it. Love and, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> and, and you know what I'm saying? So then people was like, man, like, can, just teach me. So then I realized, I was like, okay, can, this could be a business. You struck you know a nerve. Yeah, right then and there. And then my first client, he actually plays in China. He plays for the 3L3 national team. My first client ever. I met him in Australia. And uh, actually, the Chinese symbol on my logo is because of him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it says the process and manager. But uh, he gave me 100 bucks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I'm thinking, like, what? Like, you know, you give me $100 to train you for an hour. It's different now. You know, <laughs> yesterday's price isn't today's price. But, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, it, it was like, whoa. Like, you know what I'm saying? I can actually do this. And, uh, you know, I went to school, my, my master's in marketing and business and stuff like that. So once, once I just put it together, not to mention the past that I came from, you right. know what I'm saying? Of what was, you know, and I just connected it all and just turned it into a business, you know? So let's fast forward now to the process basketball. Right. Um, I, I would rather you talk about it because I'm not going to okay. do it justice. Okay. <laughs> and I want, your, I want the message of what, you're, what, you've, what you've built around the world and what you're doing with the process basketball. I really want the, the, the viewers to get a, a good feel and an honest feel of what you're doing and the why of what you're doing. So right. can you talk about the process basketball a little bit? Yeah, for sure. For everybody, uh, the process basketball is actually one of the top programs in the world. And uh, it goes beyond social media. It goes beyond all that. Like, I never needed it for what I'm doing because I'm training a lot of the national teams around the world. So, you know, when it comes to Olympic time or when it comes to uh, world championship time, it's not necessarily the best idea to reveal what I'm doing with specific teams. Right. right. You know what I'm saying? Where, and, and, and I'm also not chasing that super NBA player to get social media likes and views and all mm -hmm. that stuff. 
Like it's not necessary from what I'm doing, especially with my clientele. Uh, but it's not just because of the world-class training that I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing philanthropy at the highest levels. Yeah. And I'm the only person in the world doing it. You know what I'm saying? So one example is uh, when every, to the last, you see what's going on with Russia and Estonia and everything like that. I've been, in, I've been going to Estonia, I'm in Russia and Ukraine. I've been going to Estonia for the last three years uh, doing camps in, back, uh, in diplomacy with the, Estonia, I mean, with the Russian communities you know, over the last three years promoting peace with the United States government. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I wanted a few people in the world with reference letters from like uh, administration from Homeland, from the Obama administration uh, with Homeland Security and everything like that. So those are the level of projects that, you know, I've been doing over the last four or five years. Uh, what, what I got coming up next is uh, I'm going out to Greece. Oprah and uh, uh, Prince Harry, they got a project the, where they're helping senior refugees and stuff like that. Right. Those, that's another thing that I'm doing. Uh, you know, even with what's going on with Israel and stuff, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put together peace programs out there. And uh, I take my athletes and uh, I use them as a means to whatever the demographic is or whatever the problem is. I have those athletes a part of those specific programs really to promote peace. You know, uh, even with uh, the more than the athlete campaign that LeBron James had in Paris, yeah. I was the follow up camp to that. You know, I was the follow up host to that to keep that, you know, we're more than the athletes, which right. landed me in a book called Reverse Magazine, which is one of the biggest magazines in France. You know what I'm saying? So it's not necessarily, I don't want to say I'm comparing myself to other trainers. You know, I, I just, I'm just in my own land. And that's why I can honestly say I'm one of the biggest trainers in the world, let alone my program being one of the biggest, because I'm completely taking that philanthropy route and connecting it with my players. Like my that's players, the, they got that. I'm that's sorry, exactly the point. And that's, that's what I find yeah. incredibly important and incredibly um, noble on your behalf, because it's not just, okay, I'm going to get these NBA guys. I'm going to train them. I'm going to chase right. that check. You know, you're, right. you're providing a service. What, what you should be getting paid for that's normal but you're right. also giving back at the same time you're, you're giving back in the youth departments you're giving back in social reform you're giving back in, in right. these peace projects that you have um for for right. women's advocacy and and that's right. the thing that that i think separates you from a lot of people a lot of the the coaches or things that i've seen um lately because it, it's more about getting those likes getting right. chasing that cheddar you know, right, getting right, courtside right, right. seats so at, at the game because I, I work with right. this guy. But what you're doing is incredibly noble because you're 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 giving back, and that's what I really appreciate about what you're doing. Right. Yeah. For me, this basketball is like martial arts. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I know my style. You know, I feel like I got the best style in the world. You know, I'm taking that whole Bruce Lee approach. Like, if you want to challenge Bruce Lee, come across that. You know, <laughs> whatever you want to do. But at the same time, you know. But if you see his movies or if you read any of his books, he was really doing this to really connect the world. You right. know, in terms of teaching martial arts and uh, Jeet Kune Do and stuff like that. That's the type of approach that I'm taking. You know, if, if somebody wanted to test my style with this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I, I beat all my clients anyway. You know, I train, you know, Olympians and stuff like that. So if somebody, if a trainer or whoever wanted to really test that style, I'd be like, all right. But at the same time, it goes beyond that. Like, I take that same style. And I, I, I take it to, I take these clients. And like James Young, for example, you know, he plays out in Israel, but we both from Michigan. And every year I do a gun violence awareness program out there. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, Matthias Lazor, you know, he's from Paris. Mm -hmm. And I'm always in Paris anyway, doing, pro, pro, Paris is my second home. Yeah, and I'm always out there giving free that, camps. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm always doing free camps. Uh, Emmanuel Malou, he was a client of mine back in the day. Uh, I helped him get his first European client, I mean, European contract in Estonia. And I'm, I'm helping that South Sudan community uh, out in Australia all the time. And it's around the world. Even here in uh, Panama, where I'm at, uh, we did a really big project last year. I flew all my players out here. We did a big project helping homelessness and stuff like that. Uh, my man Juan, he just was on the uh, feed just a couple of seconds ago. He works for ESPN. He documented uh, some of the experience and everything like that. And uh, I believe I'm starting to get the reception that I, deserve, you know, that I deserve in terms of really giving back and using these players to give back. I love it, man. Um, I wanted to talk about your your high level players uh, real quick, but yeah. but what I what I what I found interesting when I was started my research with you and I started watching the the YouTube stuff that you have out there and and the, the tutorials and things like that, you keep things real basic, and I think wow. I hit you up one day and I was like, yo. That's a move that it, it was something real minded, just with a hand, a movement right. of, the, of the hand and things like that. And I remember my dad teaching me that same thing when I was a kid. Right. And yeah, it was so simple, 
And I think a lot of coaches, a lot of trainers, they they doing too much out there. Uh, to be honest, right. just doing just doing too much. They got guys dribbling right. eight to, around the back. Of, uh, right, right, right. I'm old school, so I think it's too much. But okay, right. each each his own to each his own. Right. But it was su- it, it was such a small nuance what you were teaching that I was like, man, I forgot about that. And that's right, it, it's right. such a, 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 a art to be able to simplify something and i right. think you really touched a nerve at least with me where i was like man i kind of wish i was playing <laughs> right my, my boy yeah. brent lamar he just joined in too and i'm glad you just brought up that example you know he dodged me with this one-on-one but uh <laughs> no no a, a perfect example uh he, my boy brent he was uh playing in uh hungry at the time right he was killing like he was already killing but i came out there to see him and uh we just simplified his skill set you know what I'm saying? Like just three dribble max. And, and I'm, I'm a mental coach as well. So I'm diving in that psychology to say, hey, man, you're the best person on the floor. You don't have to do all that. Right. You know what I'm saying? You are a bucket. And Brenton specifically, he is a bucket. Like uh, if, if I want to say in terms of me and what I can do, due to the fact of the gen- where he came from and what he done, he is a bucket. You know, I, I know I'm praising you right now, but, you know, but he, hey, he can play. Yourself and up, when I want to yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm giving them props. Yeah, yeah. When, when I went to, out to Hungary, we just simplified it, and we just made it efficient. He, he was killing for the rest of the season, and he's dominating in France right now. Uh, with a lot of other my, with a lot of uh, other players, too, who I work with, like, I don't make it too complex. I just make it simple. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, James Young, for example, you know, he's a great shooter, especially, you know, when he came out of Kentucky, he went to Boston and stuff like that. But uh, I just simplified it. Like, I'm like, man, you was an NBA dude. You was a top 15 draft pick. You know what I'm saying? You're the best person on the floor. Like, you don't need all that extra shit. You know what I'm saying? Just get the bucket. You know, three dribble max, jab, crossover, whatever you want to do. And it's just, like, super simple. You know, and I agree with you. Like, a lot of these trainers, man, I don't – to heat his own. But I think yeah. – it's not even a fault. You know what I'm saying? I think they're just trying to monetize. You know, like, what's really going to bring these views? What's really going to sell? You're dribbling a hundred times and you're making somebody fall and you're doing all that stuff. But that's why I, I, I stay in shape because I'm like, if somebody want to challenge, you know, when I put out my one-on-one videos, nobody really saying nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nobody like, oh, I can beat you and nothing like that. Nobody saying nothing because you have to, you have to prove your style. Right. You know what I'm saying? You have to. And then, uh, you know, I had a Nike contract when I was in France, you know what I'm saying? And it was a lot of trainers, you know, <laughs> all over the world, but nobody challenging that because you have to prove your style. And if you're losing that one-on-one game, trying to monetize it, it can really damage your whole entire training career. You know, we're in a situation... And, and, and it can situ- also damage those athletes that you're training. That's what. That's right. That's my point. I mean, that's the and, most uh, important thing. Right, right. We're in a situation where trainers can get a number of views, get a number of followers, and then they consider the best trainer in the world and even get NBA reception. Mm-hmm. And... You know, even though, like I said, to each his own, everybody can take their path. But for me, like, it's just, I believe in myself. I look in the mirror and I know who I am. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. And that's how it is, yeah. When you, when you start working with, with a, a client in, on an individual basis, right. what do you, how do you assess what they need in a pretty short amount of time? How are you able to do that? Well, it's two ways uh, how it works. Uh, you, you do have long-term assignments. So, for example, James Young, we had a long time assignment. I, when he played for Haifa, I was out in Haifa with him for a month. And, uh, you know, when I do these projects, I get the whole Kevin Hart treatment. Like, I get the stadiums, I get all that. You know what I'm saying? The coaches, I'm sitting down with the coaches. We coming up with plays for these players and everything because we, we want to maximize that success. Right. And James ended up leading the league and scoring that year because of what we did. But uh, it's more, uh, I have personal relationships with all my players. So the assessment comes off just conversation. And we watch, we might talk about film, we might watch, watch film and stuff like that, but it's just more of the conversation, it's more of the relationship. Exactly. You know, they tell me what they need, you know what I'm saying? And sometimes basketball is not even about basketball. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. uh, basketball is, and I teach, uh, basketball is based on moments, you know what I'm saying? And capitalize on them, capitalizing on those specific moments, those angles and those moments. And, and I talk to a player, I say, tell me your sweet spots. Tell me where, you, where you're most efficient. And we're just going to work on that the whole time. Mm-hmm. And that's why I, I feel like I got 100%. I, it's not even I feel like I have 100% success rate with all my top players because I just keep it simple. I mean, 
of course, when you work with a, a player individually, it doesn't matter right. if you work with him for just an hour or if you work with right. him over a longer period of time. You 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 have to have some kind of of balance where where that that player can trust you and what right. you're doing with that player, and but that player also has to be receptive to change. And I think that's a, a difficult thing for for many players to be receptive to changing something that maybe has brought them to a certain level, but they have, right. they need that next step. And so how, right. how are you able to, to get through to those players? Like, Hey, you're good, but you could be better. Right. right. So, and I'm so happy you asked this question because that is the biggest problem with a lot of trainers. Like uh, they, they, in this training world now, people monetize it to get quantity customers, but they're not going after the quality. How I'm able, and what you're asking basically is how to break a player's ego. Right. Like how I break those players' <laughs> ego, right, right, like, let's keep it real, like, all the way. I, I play them one-on-one. Like, you know what I'm saying? I say, what's, okay, if you believe in what you're talking about, what's up? And then we play, and then if I beat them or I come close, now you're thinking, like, okay, I'm this, I'm, I'm this top player. Why is my trainer competing with me? He obviously know what he's doing. A lot, of, a lot of coaches and trainers can't do that. Like, not in a fly like that. No stretching, no nothing. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and I still have that ability. And, and let's, let's, let's break it down either, even further. Because if, I mean, I'm 6'8". How tall are you? 6'2". So, if, that, I, if I walk like, in the gym and I see a 6'2 guy, you're not the, you don't look like you're the most athletic. You don't look like you're the, you know, that guy's just going to rise up and jump right. on me or something like that. And I say, I watch you right. and I say, okay, um, maybe I'm thinking about you know hiring you or something like that, and you're just killing cats. Right. Or and then we play one on one. I'm thinking I'm six eight. I got an advantage over right. over you're six two. You're too little, right? right? And so right, I can right, imagine right, right. a lot of these guys and women as well are are looking at you as on a physical standpoint and thinking, oh, right. I got this. And then you bust that tail, right? And it's like and it's a wake up call, right? It's a wake up call. Like, uh, when I, you know, this whole thing I've been doing in Estonia, I trained some of the Estonian national team players. And it got, it got like that. Like, we, they wasn't listening. It was that whole thing. And I said, all right, we're going to bring the camera out since y'all feel like y'all exactly who y'all are. <laughs> and I smashed all of them. Like, I'm beating an entire, damn near an entire national team. And it's on tape. You know what I'm saying? And so <laughs> now everybody thinking, like, damn, like, you know, we're doing the Euro championships, we're doing all this shit. And then you're getting smashed by a coach. And at that specific <laughs> time, I wasn't in the shape that I'm in now. You know what I'm saying? So it's a wake-up call. It's really breaking into that ego. And, and a lot of trainers, like you said, they're chasing that buck. They're chasing that monetization. And they don't want to hold a player accountable. At the end of the day, I know who I am. It don't matter how much money anybody got. I'm going to tell you what's up. Because I, I, my intentions is for your benefit. I want you to win. Exactly. I want you to succeed. You know exactly. what I'm saying? If, if you can't be receptive to that, it's no point. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, sometimes I do get offered big, big clients, but at the same time, I know myself. What can I teach this specific person who averaging 30 a game in the NBA? Right. You know what I'm saying? The only thing I can bring to the table is probably my philanthropy stuff, but I got to keep it real with myself, and I don't want it to become an ego dynamic between me and them. You know what I'm saying? Especially since they already got that level of success. My job is to fix somebody's career. Somebody like James Young, who made it to the NBA at the highest levels, and it didn't work out the way it was supposed to, I'm there, I was there to help him. I'm still there to help him. Like, even while he's in Israel now, I talk to him. When I was out in France training Matthias, his agency was trying to get me in Israel to work with him because he was going through it a little bit with uh, Hope Well. He plays for Hope Well Tel Aviv, and they was losing in the beginning. And then me and him had some talks, and now he's cooking. You know, they beat Maccabi Tel Aviv three or four times. And that's why and it's they, like you, know, you said, it's. It, it, and it's not just the basketball stuff. I'm okay. sure the conversations that you had with him brought him further than anything you did with him in the gym. Right. Sometimes they just right. need a, a, a an out athletes need an outlet, and they need to hear, okay, your shit does stink, but this right. is how you can change it. This is how right. it, can, it can get better, you know. And I and I, I I'm, I'm I'm with you on that 100. The the, the right. way that you're the way that you're going about what you're doing and the why is, is incredible, man. Right. Um, I, I want to run by um, the global initiative right. because I was just in the, in the garden with my, with my daughter, my daughter's 11 years old and, and I was out there filming her and watching a little film on her foot placement and stuff like that, you know, as a, right. as a dad does. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about, about 
how you came up with the the global initiative and um you know the idea of of helping women girls um succeed in in basketball how did that come about and and also why did you start that well with women specifically it was really Khalees you know what i'm saying uh, Khalees yeah yeah she cool she super cool uh, you know i call her a superhero me and her had a conversation about how people aren't putting too much emphasis on women basketball, especially in Europe and stuff like that. So me and her just been having talks about what we could do and this, that, and the other, and how we can improve it. And uh, we're trying to, the COVID hit, so it slowed things a lot. Mm-hmm. But in terms of actually going to Europe and putting initiatives together, but me and her just been in discussions on how we can put a program together and different ideas on how to improve women's basketball. And I told her specifically, it starts with her. You know what I'm saying? And that's why she's been on her, I, I believe that, She's been on like a lot of her philanthropy and really connecting with the business side of basketball because of the conversations we've had. She's doing an amazing job as well. Yeah. Uh, her career is, is coming to an end too. So she, I believe she has a vision of what her next yeah, step is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I believe that in the future, once we put together whatever we can put together in the future, it's going to be big because she is one of the top female athletes in Europe. You know, I tell her all the time, like, man, you dope. Like, you could play, but you represent more than just being an athlete. You know what I'm saying? She is African-American at the end of the day. She was born in Sweden, but she also has an American father. So she represents so many dynamics, not in just Europe, but in the United States, just all over the world. She's a world person. You know what I'm saying? And I have a couple other girls, like Shahada Duke. She plays in uh, Israel, you know what I'm saying? But she was the first uh, Arabic national team captain for the Israeli national team. You know, that's, that's you know, that's, that's big. an impossible, impossible, impossible that's, that's, situation. Yeah, that's, that's saying something. Yeah, an impossible situation. Uh, I, I believe somebody need to make a movie of her. You know what I'm saying? Because uh, of her own trials and tribulations and her being able to perform too. Like, you know, she out there killing. You know what I'm saying? Fresh off an injury or whatever, she's still doing the thing. And I believe that with women's basketball, with men's basketball, with global basketball and all together, that is the thing that brings people together. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. Okay, now I want to talk about a rather unconventional project that you have that I'm, I am super stoked to, to talk to you about. Right. Um, Basketball and comics is not conventionally ah. um, mentioned in the same breath, right? Right, 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 right. Um, Yet you had the idea to produce one, and right. um, I see it as a part auto autobiography, anime, uh, part basketball tutorial, right, right. Um, and I think I think it's dope, right? Right, right. So, tell me about about Old Man Dalton and how that came to play, and and what what you have as a vision for the future of that. Right. Well, it, it just came from the whole Dragon Ball Z, One Punch Man, you know, the whole thing, you know. Mm-hmm. What kept me going as a kid was cartoons. Even when I play basketball, I see myself as a basketball superhero. You know, what's funny is uh, I had to go to COVID jail for two weeks in, uh, here in Panama because I had COVID. And once I came back, they put you in a hotel and all that stuff. And that's when I created the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Five episodes, everything. You know what I'm saying? And uh, even the tutorial. And the tutorial is in eight different languages. But the point of it is is to bring kids in, in on the entertainment, in the entertainment side of basketball. You know what I'm saying? For them to enjoy it, you know what I'm saying? To see that playing basketball can connect the world and they can have fun with it through cartoons and stuff like that. And I actually did a podcast in Japan about it. So, you know, it's, it's starting to move, like it's starting to get traction. And uh, it's just a dope idea. Like, and all the stories it, it, are true. Yeah, yeah, all the stories are true. It's all the videos of some of the people who I beat around the world, whether it's pros or national team players, like when you see Marvel movies, when you see anime, it's just at the end of the day, it's fiction. But mine is 100% real. You know what I'm saying? So that brings another aspect to it, too. And then I built the tutorial in all these languages for it, for kids to see the tutorial so they could be basketball superheroes. You know what I'm saying? So it's in Mandarin, it's in Japanese, it's in Spanish, it's in Arabic, it's in Hebrew, it's in uh, Russian, you know what I'm saying? It's in every language, but of course, English. And uh, it's just really to teach kids, to bring kids together for everybody to be basketball superheroes. That's what it's about. Um, I'm here for it. I, I love the idea. And, and of course, right now in this day and age, anime is so big. And right, right. I mean, you, how many black guys uh, with dreads do you see in anime, right? right? So it's right, also right, an right, identification right. thing, you know, representation. And that's right. what I, that's, that's what I, what I love about it. And, and right. it's crazy because I, when, I, when, I, when I saw it first, I was like, Yo, that is a dope idea. How come nobody Thank else started it? Right. Yeah, yeah. I want, I want, I'm glad you hit that. Like, I want black kids, people of color, or anybody for that matter, to really feel like 
something like they can believe in something beyond just basketball. It could be art. It can be you could be a exactly. doctor, whatever. Yeah, it could be exactly. anything. You know what I'm saying? Language, whatever. Like yeah, this basketball is just a tool to create. I never thought in a million years I would have my own anime. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's a tool to get to different places around the world to meet right. different people. Like one of my buddies, uh, he owns a studio called Trajectory Studio in Paris. You know, he my guy. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I can connect with him anytime I want when we want to do projects. Or the owner of Reverse Rap, one of the editors of Reverse Magazine, he my guy too. So you, journalism, art, just so many different directions that basketball has opened the door for. And that comic book is for people to see a black face at the end of the day with dreads to say, man, he got his own comic book. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's real. It ain't no like, oh, he right. trying to get a good man. Nah, like this is it's real. real. Really, yeah. yeah, it's real. And and you can't take that away. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, man, it's just a blessing to be in this position. It's dope, man. Yeah. Um. So on the personal side, I, you're kind of like a nomad of sorts. You're just traveling all around the world, doing. You got different right. projects all around the world. I you, you moved, so I can't see the view that you had had before. Uh, right. yeah, I'm Panama right City. So right. How did you? How did you um, say, okay, Panama City is where I want to lay my, lay my head? Man, I came out here for vacation, <laughs> to be honest. I, I, that's how that went down. I came, out here, I came out here on vacation. I went to a place called uh, Nueva Gorgona. It's where, the, you know, the beaches and all that. And then uh, I just loved it so much. And then, you know, I got in tune with different people in the community and stuff like that. And, and at first, my, I, okay, every summer I have like a, a secret rewards. It's like a fight club of basketball. So I take all my players. I don't really bring the cameras out or none of that. I bring some of my players out. We have a private training session from players all around the world, and we just compete. You know what I'm saying? I compete with them, too. And then uh, after the fact, it it was supposed to be in Paris, but I brought everybody to Panama instead. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did, like, I took them out in the jungle, like deep in the jungle to train and everything like that. And then I did, like, a camp. You know what I'm saying? And I had like 200 kids just rush everybody and stuff like that. So everybody's shocked, like, what's going on? But for that community, they never seen players like this. You know, I got a kid named Tijan Kaida. You know, he's down there seven feet. He played for the Suns. And these, these kids, it's like, oh, my God, they're looking up to him and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? And uh, in, in Panama, I guess they have somewhat of a homelessness problem. And, and, and I just wanted to give back to show kids there that any opportunity the potential for any opportunity can actually happen. And that's why I brought my players here. And uh, I just stayed, uh, you know what I'm saying? And I can, yeah, you know, but I, I still travel wherever I go. Right. The majority right. of my business is in Europe. Uh, in Paris, it runs itself. You know, I'm tapped into the streetball co- community there. You know, I got commercials and everything out there. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, like I said, it's a blessing, man. It's a blessing. I mean, you're a long way from home, man. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I, yeah. I, I'm the same. I'm also a long way from Vegas out here in Germany. Yeah, you're in Germany. You're right. So, right. so it's um, it, it takes a special person to to grow roots somewhere else other than home. You right, know? right. It right. really and does, was, and, and it's 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 not easy. It's it's not for everybody. Right, right. Uh, all these places for me, Paris is my second home. Uh, Australia is one of my homes. I got personal friends there that, whenever I land, we can do whatever we want. You know, it's not uncomfortable. It's not always about business. I do business super informal anyway. You know what I'm saying? And even with working with the United States government and, and Estonia and all these other places around the world, working with different governments, they believe in my product. They believe in what I do. They know that what I'm going to do is going to be right, whether it's with the top players or whether it's with just a, a philanthropy and stuff like that. They know it's going to go the right way. And I think I, over the last three, four years, I really wasn't pushing social media like that. But I think now is my coming up party. Now it's time to really, not necessarily on a monetization standpoint, but to really express what we're doing around the world with philanthropy. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes hand in hand. You can you can use social media for for good, or you can right. use it for for bad. It's like what we talked right. about earlier that right. we've got to connect through social media. And and right. as long as people use it wisely, you can do a lot of good things with social media. Of right. course, you can do some really terrible things with social media. Right. Exactly. Right? If you're focused from the beginning and you know what your your goal is, you know what you're doing, you believe in what you're doing, and that's right. that's how I am with with what I do as well. There's the sky is the limit, and, and right, yeah, right. I applaud you for, for for the route that you you're going, and that you've kind of flown a little bit under the radar right. a little bit. But like you said, like now is the time for you to to come out, and it's not about the money; it's about sharing experiences, it's about philanthropy, right. it's about helping, it's about giving back. And you know, money comes and goes, but 
leaving your legacy is, is, is important. Right, and that's what it is for me, is leaving my le legacy. You know, uh, I'm nominated for the Michigan Hall Sports Hall of Fame. And, you know, after that, you know, I want to get a Nobel Peace Prize, man. I want to do TED Talks. <laughs> I want to do stuff like that. Right. And I feel like what I'm doing <laughs> can't get there. You the know what I'm saying? It, to get you where you want yeah, to Yeah, definitely. Uh, what I'm doing is so beyond basketball. Yeah. But it's just basketball is that tool to open those doors, to connect with people and stuff like that. So, and there's, no, nothing, man, I, there's nothing wrong with that. No, not at all. Not at, nothing all. Wrong. not at all. Yeah. So. Oh, you've got so much going on, man. What do you do to, to chill? What do you do to relax? Like, how do you separate <sighs> yourself and, and, like, disconnect? And, like, what right. do you do to, to just chill? Yeah, watch cartoons. <laughs> this is my chill man like <laughs> yeah let's watch cartoons man play video games every now and again but i don't even really play video games like that uh i'm, I'm fully immersed in what i do so that is my chill yeah. uh when i'm when i'm with players like again we ha we have bonds we have actual relationships like uh t john for example like his mom worked at disney paris and she she hooked me up with tickets you know, T. John Kaida, like, you know, I got personal relationships with people. So through these journeys, through these relationships, that's when I get my chill. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, I, you know, that, that's when I get to relax, really, is when I see me, the manifestation of everything that I'm doing. And then I'm saying, okay, you know, yeah. yeah. So basically, I never stop. You know, it just keeps <laughs> going. I might watch Dragon Ball Z every now and again, but it don't stop. <laughs> yeah. You know? I got you. Yeah. All right, man. So that's the, the first part of the interview. I appreciate it. Um, the next part is a little bit of overtime where I ask you a couple of questions, okay. uh, quick, quick answer questions. Um, so let's get to it. Who influenced okay. your game the most when you were young? Man, I don't want to be arrogant about this, man. I, was, I would say me, but no. Uh, Kobe Bryant, no. Kobe Bryant or Allen Iverson. Okay. Those are my two. Uh, but that's the, on the street bar side, it was skip to my loop. Right. You know, because it was right. a story. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was him. It was right. him being a street ball player, going through that whole one circuit and making it to the NBA. Yeah. But in terms of uh, killer instinct, it was definitely Allen Iverson and it was Kobe Bryant. Um, what was your welcome to overseas moment in Israel? Like from coming from where you came from, from your background and just coming off of one on one King of the Hill kind of thing. Right. Um, right. And then you get to Israel for your first for your first. Pro, pro debut. What was right. your welcome to the to the league moment? Kind of like, okay, this is not like it is back home. Right, conditioning and help side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got a Lithuanian dude in the middle of the lane. <laughs> that ain't no joke. And I ain't athletic. I'm not dunking on nobody. <laughs> so you know, that's when that hero. <laughs> that's when I had to come in or a step back. Nah, that that and the conditioning like. Because I'm a pace player, you know, it's different than, yeah, yeah. you know, going downhill and doing that. Like, you, if I got to push, I got to push it up. Then I got to set it up. You know what I'm saying? So it's the, it's the condition, it definitely. Yeah, yeah. Give me, helps a, give me um, the best trash talking story you got. Either you telling talking uh, trash to somebody or somebody talking trash to you. Man. All those one-on-one -on -one battles, it's got to be mad, mad trash talking stories. Okay, so I was in Miami. Uh, you know how they have the, the Miami runs with uh, Michael Beasley and all them guys. Yeah. So I was out there one time, and I was playing. And, uh, you know, I was out there getting buckets. You know, and uh, Michael Beasley, you know, he a tough one. He a tough <laughs> one. Like, you know, he, he a tough one. But one time I scored, and I was like, man, I'm God out here. Like, you know what I'm saying? I don't care what. <laughs> money you got. I don't care what it is. Like, that, this is who I am. And I, I, you know, from what was going on in that circuit, people respected me saying that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because when I play, I'm a shit talker. Like, I really talk that shit. Like, I know how to really, but I don't do it like in a loud, trying to embarrass you way. Right, right. I do it like personally, like, I'm in your ear, like, you know, like you can't, you know, you can't really, you know, you can't really F with me type deal. Like, right. and I'm talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. I'm that guy. You know what I'm saying? I bring it to you so you can see me looking you in your eye rather than trying to be loud and boisterous and everybody can say it. Uh, and that run in Miami is tough. That's one of the best runs in the country, man. And uh, for me to get that opportunity to play with those guys and, and then, you know, it was a blessing for me just to be there because that's the essence of basketball that I love yeah. the most. Somebody like Michael Beasley, does, he deserves to be in the league. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I understand 
off the court issues and stuff like that. But like but talent wise, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. He deserves to be in the league and uh, programs like mine. I want to connect with people like him and like James Young. Like it, it worked for James. That's why he ended up to get re- resigning with the Knicks. You know what I'm saying? I want those are the type of players that I go after. You know what I'm saying? Who I can help, who I can actually help them transition uh, on and off the court. So, yeah, that's, that's basically – I got a lot of stories of me just talking shit, man, but I can't even <laughs> – you know? Yeah, through, that's my best one. Through your travels in different countries, what country or what players from what country surprised you the most at the, the talent level? Mm. Uh, France, we already knew was always uh, yeah. France, that I think that did. that goes without saying. But what other countries? Yeah, uh, I would say Israel, mm-hmm. because at the time I didn't even know what Israel was when I first went over there. I just jumped off the ship and went. You know what I'm saying? But it was Israel. I didn't know anything about Maccabi Tel Aviv and its history. I didn't know anything about Hope Wells, Rose, and its history and stuff like that. And then uh, when I was there at the time, Joe Ingles was there, and that's when they won the championship, mm-hmm. the Euroleague championship. Uh, Mari was there too. You know what I'm saying? So at that, yeah, at the time when I was there, even though I wasn't even playing at those highest levels, I was amongst, I knew those guys and I knew that Tyrese Rice was there. That's when it was one of those championships. And then before Keith Langford was there and, you know, uh, Israel, the, to me, like the talent wise, especially with the Americans they bring in, is one of the biggest, one of the best places in the world to me. Australia is tough too. Uh, yeah. Especially, it's starting to come up. Uh, they got an aggressive style of basketball, a, a way of playing basketball. It's, it's pretty intense. And I wish Australia and Europe would find, I know it's far, but I wish they would find ways to compete with each other to really see who's the best. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, because, yeah, uh, yeah in, the, in, the, in the Olympics in Tokyo, France got the uh, silver and, and Australia got the bronze. But I feel like that's not enough. Right, you know it's not saying? enough think, going, going against each other, right? Right, right, right. It's not enough for them to compete with each other because Australia has an amazing, amazing talent, especially with, uh, the South, with a number of African communities coming in there. Mm-hmm. And I think they would uh, engage in that a lot more if they got the opportunity to right. uh, compete with Europe. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because Australia is a little isolated with their league and stuff like that. Right. But if they, if they did like the NBA and travel and vice versa, I believe like basketball is really a world league. It can be as, just as big as soccer if people put the effort into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you're always on the move. What's something that you always forget to pack that you have to buy in, in your destination where you go? Man, I'm the type of guy who don't even really take luggage anyway. <laughs> like, you know, as long as I got my wallet, my toothbrush, and my passport, <laughs> I'm good. And then when I get there, I buy my stuff. Okay. And then uh, a lot of times uh, I give my stuff away too. So, like, it's been times where I don't have some brand new Jordans on. If I see somebody homeless, I just give it to them. Or whatever I bought then and there, I just give them my suitcase and just, and then when I give it, you know, I got clothes in the crib, so it don't matter. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I normally do. Like, I try to give back at every spectrum, you know, because me being in these places is, just, is a blessing. Yeah. Um, last question. Tie game. Game is on the line. Your ball. Right. What's your go-to move? Man. What's your go-to move? You always got to – everybody's got that go-to move where they know that they're going to hit that 90% of the time, and then right, you got right. the counter off of your go-to in case somebody takes it away. I want right. to know what's your go-to. Man, it depends on what headspace I'm in. Like, uh, I know I spoke a bit about arrogance. It's a, it's a line for me that draws between arrogance <laughs> and confidence, right? And it depends on what headspace I'm in. I'm, in a, I'm a type of guy who – I'll pull it up with just one hand and shoot it in, in clutch game. Like, I'm not – or if it becomes – it just depends on what headspace in. So I can't even say what my go-to is because I'm a counter player anyway. So is this – if it's three, two, I won't – like, it's just whatever. <laughs> yeah. But then I, I can be in my own arrogant headspace and I do something silly like a one-footer, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying, fade away or something like that. I do that a lot in my, in my one-on-ones and stuff like that almost to just make these impossible shots and stuff, which I can say has been a problem in my career. And I don't <laughs> teach that at all, because, <laughs> you know, because of my own confidence. And you know what I'm saying? Like some of the shots that I've made against some of these pro players, I'm just throwing it up with one, like, with one hand for no reason, just to prove a point, just to prove to myself that I can make it. So, man, I just do things very unconvincingly. Like, that's that's the best way I can say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. man, thank you, man. You, you hit the shot at the butter from, buzzer from me, man. I, I really appreciate you, appreciate you coming on. And, and yeah, thank you. 
giving some insight on what you do all around the world and, and why you do it. I think that's the most important thing is the, the why someone does something. And, and you're on a good way, man. I, I appreciate you coming on, man. And I appreciate you for having me, man. If you need anything, I'm gonna, feel free I'm gonna to make sure. Man. I'm going to make sure. I mean, we're going to be in contact anyway. We already started yeah. talking about camps and stuff like that. But I'm going to make sure yeah. that um, I get all your, your stuff in the YouTube description so people can check you out. And okay. um and and let's let's get this thing growing and and keep keep the momentum you have and and really stay with it, man. I, I really appreciate you what you're doing. I and I and I'm fo- I'm 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 a fan, man. So thank so you, man. I appreciate you so much. Let's let's keep it going, man. All right. Yeah. Talk so, to you later, man. Hit me up. Anytime. All right, man. Get on up out of you. All right. Talk to you later. later. Yeah. Peace. So teammates. So I hope you like the first part of my trilogy for tonight i'll take a couple of minutes off and and be back in a couple of minutes at uh in 14 minutes to be exact um that was great tremaine he, he really did a great job tonight and and what he's doing around the world is is important what he's doing and and i appreciate when when people do things for the love and not for the money or for status or things like that and and i i i commend him on what he's doing so make sure you give him a follow on instagram i'll, I'll have everything in the in the description on the youtube channel when i post it tomorrow and uh, make sure you follow him check up on what he's doing support any way you can and and like i said keep the momentum going for 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 the things that he's doing um yeah you guys know follow me you know i I do what i do out of love and i hope you guys see that and i hope i'm able to give you guys and girls uh valuable information through this series and yeah that, that's it for tonight, or actually for right now. I'll be back in now 13 minutes uh, with the second part of this trilogy episodes that I have for tonight, and I hope you guys will tune in. If not, everything will be on YouTube tomorrow. So that's it for now. Let me go grab a bite to eat. Old head out.